think any entrepreneur is constantly worried that what they're doing is the right thing. Um, if you weren't, you'd be reckless. And there's a difference between being adventurous and being reckless. You know, reckless is just being stupid and not considering it. Adventurous is giving something new a go because you think you have that advantage. You think you can succeed. You're willing to try. Welcome to the Cocoon Podcast. My name is Erica, Managing Partner at Cocoon Ignite Ventures. Together with my two other managing partners at the fund, Theodore and Roland, we invite you to tune in here, where you will find conversations we have with founders and investors on the future and sustainability of work. We have been talking and listening to founders and investors in Silicon Valley, Southeast Asia, Greater Bay Area, and the One Belt region for over a decade. There's so much to learn through venture capital conversations, and we decided to turn these meetings into a podcast to demystify what actually happens on the ground. If you're inspired by these stories and want to work or collaborate with any of our founders or investors, then our call to action is reach out by searching for Cocoon Born to Fly on LinkedIn. We'd love to connect there. Welcome, Dr. David Getting. We're very happy to have you on the podcast today. And I know you as a veterinary surgeon with a lot of hospitals and now a thriving e-commerce business. But I hear through the grapevine that you won the World Marathon Challenge in 2015, where you did seven marathons in seven continents in seven days. Now, can we start there? Tell us about this amazing race. I, I really worry when everyone starts there because the first thing people think is this is some kind of crazy guy. And, and it actually seemed perfectly rational at the time for me to do this. So I'll say that much to start with. Um, I will also say it was my wife's 40th birthday present to me to actually go and do this. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say on that note is she's not stupid. She doubled my life insurance when she sent me on this because she seriously thought I wasn't going to come back from it. That is a very special 40th birthday present, one of a kind. No, it was fantastic. So, so I mean, to give you an idea on this, I, um, I definitely haven't been a lifelong athlete. I had a sort of, uh, as a child, I was probably too heavy and, and, and didn't really do any sport at all. Um, and when, fast forward to when I was about 30 something, when my first child was about to be born, uh, my wife said to me, look, you've got to, you know, Pull yourself in line and get healthy and, and, and be a good example to your daughter, um, which I took to heart. I took it very seriously. And we had a bit of an argument about it because you never really want to sort of admit who your true self is. Uh, and I said, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. Anyway, I went to, I stormed off angry and to prove her wrong, on that night, I signed up for a 100 kilometer, no, sorry, a 200 kilometer ultra marathon in Northern China, never having run a kilometer in my life. Um, I had nine months to train for it, but I was, I was kind of, it was a moment of, I'm going to prove you wrong. And I guess you may say I got bitten by the bug. I did, I did train for it. I did prepare very carefully. I did do that ultra marathon, but then things kept going on and on and on and on. Um, and I guess it got to a point after a while when I was trying to I'm kind of one of these guys who always wants to find the next thing, you know, what, what more could you do? What more could you do? What, how could you advise yourself more? Um, and in marathon circles, there's this concept of doing what they call a grand slam, which means you've done all the famous marathons. And it's like uh, Boston, New York, Chicago, London, Tokyo, whatever. Um, and I thought about it and I thought that was kind of interesting. I've done Boston, so I had one out of there, but I, it was interesting to do that. But I actually thought let's take it one more step and try and do a marathon on every continent. And then I thought, well, that's seven continents and seven days in a week and it all just kind of in my crazy mind fell into place. And that's how it got started. So zero to a hundred kilometers. And then from that, seven continents in seven days. Can you break that down a little for, for those of us include like folks like myself who have zero clue how the logistics even works. How do you get from one continent to the next? And how do you get yourself well rested for the next day's marathon? Okay, so um, first things first, we, we, I, I did do it with a group of people, uh, you know, when, when I found out about, when, when I got more enthusiastic about this, I did what everyone does, and you go onto Google and you search for it, and you find there are other people just as crazy and stupid as you in the world. So um, I, I did this sort of, this, this organized event. We took normal 
claims uh, for every part of the journey, except, so the route was we, we went uh, first to Antarctica uh, and you have to kind of start in Antarctica because the weather's so unpredictable. You know, if you're going for seven days, you have to start there because you don't know quite when you're gonna land or when you're gonna take off. So that has been the first one. Antarctica in South America, we're in Chile. North America was Madrid, uh, Miami. Europe was Madrid, uh, Morocco for Africa, Dubai for Asia, and then finish under the Harbour Bridge in Sydney, Australia. So that was kind of the route. To get to Antarctica, we hitched a ride aboard this kind of old Russian military plane uh, called an IL-76. And they were transporting soldiers, Argentinian soldiers down to Belgrano, which is a base in, Argentina, in, in Antarctica. Um, <clears throat> And we were fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to get on board this plane because there's, there's no commercial flights to Antarctica. There's no sort of, you know, Cathay Pacific doesn't have an Antarctica. Right, route. right. It's not um, a weekend trip. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, we see, so, so but, but this was kind of the problem, right? Because we flew this Russian plane um, and, and it was in a different age and this was a Russian plane piloted by Ukrainians. So you, I don't think you'd get that in this day and age, but it's sort of a, a different age before right. what now is happening. The weirdest thing for me, again, this is going to make you laugh, but I'd actually never seen really snow before I got to Antarctica. Because I come from Australia, there's no real snow in, in Australia. Um, I'd seen a little bit here or there, but, but in Antarctica, we landed on this massive patch of ice and there's no, no control tower, there's no nothing. It was just sort of, we landed and this Jeep pulled up and we had to jump in it quickly because the plane had to take off again. Uh, if it didn't take off again fast enough, it would freeze to the runway, and then it obviously wouldn't be ever taking off again. And we went, got transported to this little tent in the middle of the northern snow. And then we had to wait, and we had to wait for the plane to come back. And there was no sort of fixed schedule because there was a military plane that only came back when I had to do military stuff. But we couldn't wow. start that first marathon until the plane was in the air coming back to Antarctica to take us back to Chile. Otherwise, we'd be out in seven days. Uh, and so actually the first marathon started at three o'clock in the morning because the plane was in the air. We got, we got, they shook us out of bed and said, look, the plane's in the air, you've got to run now. And so at three in the morning, we started running with the idea we'd do the marathon and run straight onto the plane and go to the next place. Three in the morning, it didn't really matter because it's daylight 24 hours a day in Antarctica anyway. So it was still daylight, it was fine. It is the perfect way to see snow for the first time. And it is an epic way to start a marathon. It was really cool. Um, it was, I, I, got, I actually got a bit carried away. Uh, and, and I had a, I actually had a, a coach who's coached me through all these things. And I guess that's one piece of advice I give to anyone. It is, you know, uh, it, it's that old adage. It's just so, it, it sounds so trite. But if you surround yourself by people who are much smarter and much better at stuff than you are, you've got a fair chance of doing okay in life. And so I found a coach who was absolutely wonderful and coached me through this. His advice to me was, whatever you do, don't go too hard on the first day because you've got six more days mm. and six more marathons. Right. I got about half an hour into the marathon and thought this was absolutely amazing. I was loving it. And so I thought, to heck with it. I'm just going as hard as I possibly can. And I ran really, really hard. Um, and when I crossed the finish line, they said to me that I'd just set a new world record for the fast ever marathon in Antarctica, which I didn't know at the time until I got the finish line. But talk about like, seven words you never think are going to be spoken to you in your life. You've just said right. it in Antarctica. So that was, that was amazing. You are always amazing us with everything you do. I mean, like veterinary surgeon goes on a marathon, starts in Antarctica, and you set a world record in running a marathon in Antarctica. That's amazing. To be entirely honest with you, I, I, <laughs> and again, it sounds like another thing that people roll out, but I, I, I'm not particularly the world's greatest runner. Uh, I didn't have any particular talents, but I just kind of thought this sounds amazing and I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that I can't do it. And, you know, I think that's kind of been one thing I've tried in everything I've done. Again, someone way smarter than me, who was actually a sort of a mentor to me, said to me once, if you don't do it, you know, someone else will. So why not give it a try? If someone else can do it, you can do it too. And I guess the Antarctic thing was a bit stupid that I'd never really seen snow before. I didn't have any experience in running in snow. I made so many mistakes, but I thought, well, just why hold yourself back? Just give it a go. This is the perfect segue to your entrepreneurial journey. How did an Aussie come out to Asia, this part of Asia in Hong Kong, 
And I, I recall you telling me you started out as a vet in a van and driving it around. And then that was 20 years ago. Tell us about that journey. Okay, so I guess you're right. It is there's a there's a pattern of behavior emerging here where I kind of don't think really very carefully before taking action. Um, <clears throat> same as the marathon in Antarctica. So my wife and I met my wife at university, um, and we worked for a year in Australia where where I grew up, and then we decided we wanted to sort of have some adventure. Um, <clears throat> as a veterinarian, there's only some countries you can work in because of like licensing rules. So as an Australian vet, you can work in essentially Commonwealth countries, which is Australia, New Zealand, UK, Hong Kong, and Singapore and so forth. And I'd never really traveled at all, but Hong Kong sounded like a really cool place. Um, we had this plan to do a world world tour where we'd do all those countries. You know, I'd do two years in Hong Kong, then two years in the UK, then two years in, I don't know, New Zealand. Got to Hong Kong, loved it. 20 something years later, never left. Um, so I guess that's how we got to Hong Kong. We came with absolutely nothing. We had three backpacks and we lost one of those on the plane on the way over. So we, we really came here with, and, and and I think, you know, for my own children, I'd say that's something, uh, I really want to encourage this idea of just sometimes you've got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to use your sense and you've got to use your wits and, and not be given everything um, and, and the hustle. Right. Absolutely. That was, that was actually really cool for my, you know, I remember back to those days and as some of the, we had nothing, but we had everything to get. So, you know, <clears throat> what, what, what am I trying to say? Although we had nothing, we had nothing limiting us either. And that was kind of really cool. I yeah. love that analogy. And, you know, I, I'm so glad, okay, we met maybe three years ago and by then you were already an entrepreneur, but everything that you've done so far sounds so entrepreneurial I'm like you're the perfect profile of a founder because you're going to go do stuff no one's done before and you're not afraid to do it and you're not afraid to fall down you get up and you just keep going so what was it what was it first like when you were like how did you first get a van how did you build your first clinic and then your first hospital and then you know towards the seventh hospital I know you recently got acquired like tell us break that journey down a little bit like what was that like so when I first came over here I worked for another vet clinic for a year or so just because as I say, there wasn't this plan in my head to, for Hong Kong to be a long-term base. There's more just a stop on the road. Um, got here and I loved it, but I, I think um, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm a good entrepreneur or a good you know, person to model yourself on, but I've always tried to look at things a little bit differently and see what could be done in a different way from a customer or a client's perspective that might be better. Um, <clears throat> and to me, this idea of having... You know, there's this real, in my mind, a pet is part of your family. And it's, it's, it's you know, uh, there's a real strong bond between owners or pet parents and their pets. Um, and sort of taking that and making it sort of a family service where I did come to someone's home and I spent more time with them and I really got to know them at a small number of customers or clients. Uh, but those clients I had a really strong bond with, it kind of seemed like a natural fit for how you could be a vet and make it a really nice job and, and you know like any kind of idea I think that works you don't go in there trying to make money um it was more that I thought it was a really nice idea that people would get into and it was a nice way to start um and that was another piece you know I think along my life I've been given really good advice by people and one of my very early clients who was um a very very successful business person said to me don't ever go out trying to make money because you won't you know go out doing what you believe is good and what you love and the money will come. You don't have to worry about that side of the business. Um, I think that was kind of true. That is so true. That is so true. And great insight. I think, you know, from a, from a true pet lover, um, pets are part of the family, um, taking care of people's pets, taking care of their families. How did that evolve from one Dr. David to many clinics, many hospitals. What what happened um, with that next leap from, I guess, your first 100 kilometers to your next <laughs> marathon? Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say to you is that a lot of my colleagues in the veterinary business here who were close friends and were trying to give me good advice told me it was a really crazy idea and it wasn't going to work. Um, and I, I'm very, very respectful of them saying that, but it was quite a different idea. And I guess that would, again, be advice I'd give to someone. If, you, if your gut tells you it's worth trying something and the risk of trying it is not going to break you if you feel it's going to work give it a go don't listen to other people that say it's not going to work you know give it a go and, and and i was very fortunate in my case this did work and it was and it worked quite well um and <clears throat> the first thing that happened is after about three months 
my wife, who had a very, very good job in Hong Kong doing her own thing, decided that, that uh, you know, to be honest, she was a better business person. I, I was good for looking after animals. She was good for running a business. So she came and joined the company and became effectively my boss, which she still is to this day. Um, and, and then, you know, it, it honestly took a while. The, the business was busy quite quickly, which was great. Um, but it, it does become quite hard when you build a business around one person because then taking another person on, you have to sort of, it, it can't be all about seeing Dr. David and having a personal relationship. You have to find people who are very like-minded and have the same values as you and bring them into the company. <clears throat> what happened is um, we, we got busier and we were using my friend's hospital. You know, I, I had a house call car where I went out to those houses, but when your dog needed hospitalization or x-ray or surgery, I took it to a friend's hospital. They're very kind and let me use their hospital. After a while, my friends said, look, you know, we're happy to help up to a point, but you're using our hospital more than we are. It's time for you to set up your own shop. Um, and so that That's was always of, a good problem. And they, they said it in the nicest possible way and, 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 um, and, and helped me get my own shop started. We started that first hospital and it's still open today um, in, in just down the road from here. Um, we started that hospital in the middle of SARS. Uh, and again, pattern of behavior, maybe I don't think too carefully at what I'm doing. And I remember being interviewed at the time by Bloomberg, who said to me, everybody else is shutting up shop and leaving Hong Kong. What on earth are you thinking? And I kind of realized at that point, I hadn't really thought about it. it just seemed like a good idea at the time. So this is, this is the Antarctica, you know, first, first leg of the race kind of feeling, right? And for those who don't or too too young to know about SARS in Hong Kong, 2003 was a time when Hong Kong basically shut down for, I think, about a year or two um, because we, we had a COVID-like situation then. And when you, when you made that leap with Trilby, by the way, Trilby White is a hero. I love working with her. And you're right, she is your boss. She's my boss. She's everybody's boss because she knows her stuff. And I respect that. And and it takes a leader to bring together the right team. So like you said, you're the veterinary surgeon. She may be the business person behind it, but you always need all these different components, um, all these different um, people behind the team um, to, to bring a business together. So 2003 happens, you start the business, and then, then, then what happened? How did it scale from one veterinary hospital to seven? Yeah, I, you know, um, it's funny how they, they talk about evolution, evolution in sort of evolution for animals and, 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 and so forth. And they say it goes in fits and starts, you know, things sort of plateau for a while, then you get a huge jump, then it plateaus for a huge jump. And, and that was the same for us. You know, we had, we started the house call business and we got that going. And then we had this huge jump to a clinic and we, we got that going for a while. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, again, it was this kind of idea of, what is the knot in the market? And in the market at that time, there wasn't really a credible, or there wasn't much of an after hours service for people. So if your dog got sick at midnight, what did you do? And, and, and so we thought, okay, let's do this. Um, and, you know, and, and that turned out to work quite well. So that helped us expand. And I think what we really did is tried to build, I know it's a bit of a buzzword, we tried to build this ecosystem where essentially if you had a sick dog or a sick cat, or, or sorry, if you had a dog or a cat, we could do anything you want. You know, we could do the house call. We could do the daytime vaccination. We could take care of them after hours. We started up the e-commerce business because if you needed dog food, we could get you dog food. We wanted to be the one stop that we could help you with all your dog problems. Um, and we just kept bolting on new pieces that we thought would be helpful and be additive. And you've got to be really, really careful about that. There were, there were also things we chose specifically not to do. We chose not to be groomers and we chose not to be a boarding kennel. And we had those op opportunities but those were too far outside our real knowledge area of medicine and, and healthcare. We tried to stick with our knowledge area, but, but when it comes to medicine and healthcare, anything you wanted, Creature Comforts was happy to help you with it. That is such great insight, right? How do you build a business where you can focus on your strengths and keep building on that until you reach sort of the total addressable market rather than like build horizontally across the category in areas that you know, you may not have the best advantage in, like, for example, if, if you were to do, um, you know, a, a, a dog hotels or pet hotels, you know, it's a real estate issue. It's much less of a, of a veterinary issue. But it's really important for people to realize what their strengths are. And you said it exactly right, where your advantage is, where you're, where you're better than the next person. 
um, where you bring more skill to the table, more more opportunity. Um, <clears throat> just because it is, it, just because you can, it doesn't always mean you should. Make sure you can compete. And you, one of one of my again, I keep talking about sort of my mentors and friends, but another mentor and friend here that I, that I really respect, um, a guy called Nick Lai who, who who runs Hong Kong Broadband Network. He he always talks about his legal unfair competitive advantage, and what he's saying is that it's, you know, what's obviously you can never break the rules, but what can you do better than the next guy? I love Nick. He is a wealth of knowledge and experience. And, you know, the team he's built at HKBN is admirable. Um, and I so agree with, with what you just said about the legal um, uh, unfair, advantage. Competitive, yeah. unfair competitive advantage. Exactly. Um, right. and, and I know that, you know, in 2022, um, you, you sold Creature Comforts Group to the Mars Veterinary Health um, that's great. Yep. So what was that like? What's it like selling, you know, your business of 20 years and what was the process and, and, and how's that, how's that going now? I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's, it's, it's so weird because I didn't kind of realize until after I'd gone through it, that it was kind of like my baby had grown up and left home. Um, <clears throat> and, and we're still very closely involved. Um, both Trulby and Trulby's there every day and, and I'm working there regularly as well. So we're still closely involved. Um, you know, the first thing I'd say is it was incredibly, um, you know, heartwarming and flattering that someone else would see our baby as also being as attractive as we saw it, which was which was wonderful. Um, we 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 got to a point where, you know, we got to a point of where we had I think about 120 staff across all locations, and we I, I talked about that evolutionary chain where you go in sort of plateaus and then jumps, and and for us to take the next big jump was going to take such, firstly, such capital investment, but also such a network globally of, of talent recruitment and training and development. We needed to see someone else come in and help us with that. And, and, and Mars were able to bring that. They were able to bring the tra training, the talent, the systems, and also the capital to grow. <clears throat> and, and definitely, I don't see that I have walked away into the sunset and left Creature Compass behind. What I see is I've brought in a new steward who's going to be able to do you know, a, a, a better job than I could in helping the staff, helping the animals, helping the company grow to the next level. When it comes to entrepreneurship, founders need the grit and the courage and the passion. And like you said, you know, run the first seven legs, but what happens in the next 70 legs, right? Like how do you bring in strategic partners who refuel mm -hmm. to systematically scale it out? Now I know that seven years ago, you embarked on the Vetopia venture. So can you give us like a 30 second intro into what is Vetopia and why you started it and where it is now? Okay, so uh, Vetopia, again, this was born of that kind of idea of providing everything you need for your pet from a health and, and, and wellness angle. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, those house call customers, the house call clients, or even clinic clients asking us where to buy something, what the best dog food they should feed is, you know, or even just, uh, you know, can you deliver, when you come around to a house call, can you bring me a bag of dog food? And we kind of thought, okay, this is something people need and this fits in with our values and what we can do and we can provide a good service here. We have an advantage. Um, and so we decided to start an e-commerce platform. And this was back in 2015 where, yes, absolutely e-commerce existed, but it certainly wasn't quite as all pervasive as it is today. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, again, we started it pretty small. It was... Uh, one of my nurses was sort of essentially running the running the platform and a marketing lady was helping. Uh, and I'm super proud to say that I'm actually at the Vetopia office now. I'm in the warehouse. Um, but I'm super proud to say that those two people are still sitting upstairs from me and they're still with us seven years on. And they're now, they're now in senior positions in the company, which I think is, again, super important with this idea of I certainly can't do what they do. And when you find good people and you build that team, you stick with that team and they grow with you and they, they, they grow the company. So... Um, <clears throat> Vetopia uh, provided this e-commerce service and, and provided sort of pet supplies and pet products that we as pet owners and pet parents thought were the best in the business and what people should have. But more than that, we tried to be a place which really strengthened that bond between, you know, it's not just a place where you log on and buy a dog bag of dog food. You can call us up, you can message us, you can say my dog likes this. We will we'll get involved in that conversation with you, and we'll try and really bond and 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 become part of that discussion with you. And so Vetopia grew quite well. 
Um, and it, it had, you know, every year it grew larger and larger and larger. In the last couple of years, it really has come into its own. Um, and we've tried to extend that idea of, you know, it's not just other people's products. Nowadays, we're actually going into making our own products, having our own brands, which essentially we're trying to make what we would want for our own pets and give it to other people. I really respect your core value of Vectopia in terms of taking care of people's pets and then providing them the best options for healthcare, food, vitamins. Like you said, I think the most unique part of this e-commerce business is having Dr. David on board and having your nurses, like, you know, being able to talk to them about, you know, what my cat or dog might need um, or how they're doing before you decide what to buy, right? Uh, I think fast e-commerce is so pervasive, but um, thoughtful, care, caring commerce, that's, that's not common at all. Um, well, look, you, it's, 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 it's like, <clears throat> you know, again, going back to what you were saying a couple of minutes ago, this legal unfair competitive advantage, let's face it, I'm never going to be able to compete with Amazon. I'm never going to be able to compete with HKTV more, which are the big marketplace providers here. Um, they have the scale that, 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 that will always beat me. But, you know, you, you've got to figure out no matter what you're doing in business, what your advantage is, you can't fight people on their terms. You've got to compete on your terms and you've got to capture the market which wants your terms. The people who buy from me probably don't want to buy from Amazon because they, they, they might buy some stuff, but they, want, they come to me because they might want that relationship and that sort of personal service and that recommendation and to know what everything they buy is quality. Um, and so that's where our competitive advantage was in the online space. Because you're right, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a super competitive market. And I, I go back to what you were saying before. Uh, you are saying something about sort of I jump in and don't get worried about it. I, I, I wish that was true. I, I, I do. Uh, I think any entrepreneur is constantly worried that what they're doing is the right thing. Um, if you weren't, you'd be reckless. And there's a difference between being adventurous and being reckless. You know, reckless is just being stupid and not considering it. Adventurous is giving something new a go because you think you have that advantage. You think you can succeed. You're willing to try. Reckless and adventurous, totally different. And the outcomes are totally different, right? Um, and I connect this back with, you know, your initial passion of, of taking care of pets, like their family, right? E-commerce is a platform. E-commerce is a process. But the values behind which you bring that value to your customer is what matters. Um, you talked about 24 seven care. You talked about being able to bring the pets in, you know, for the vaccination, it, it, you know, and like you said, what they, what they consume every day, the vitamins they take, the, the products they use, that's also part of their 24 seven care. So to that extent, I feel like what I'm learning today and connecting today is Vetopia and what you started with 20 years ago with Creature Comforts is sitting on the same set of values which you know, I find you know, very, very inspiring. Now, um, I know that you guys had an amazing turnout at the recent Pet Expo, and you were launching Animal Kind and Natural uh, Animal Solutions. Can you tell us more about these products? You alluded to them earlier. Like, you know, why did you start your own brand of products and what's it like in the B2B, B2C landscape? About a year ago, uh, I got this idea. I mean, again, it was based on sort of what customers and what clients told me. And people sort of would buy a bag of dog food and there'd be an ingredient list as long as their arm and they wouldn't know what half the ingredients were. And the main ingredient was uh, something bizarre like chicken feathers or rendered fat or, 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 or one of these, or and, you know, they look down at sort of chemical names and, and people were- No way, they, chicken feathers? They put chicken feathers in pet food? One of, uh, I hate what? to say it, one of the biggest selling diets is made up of hydrolyzed chicken feathers. Uh, okay, shocking. It's, uh, uh, and, and, let me sort of paraphrase that by saying nutritionally, it actually, I hate to say it, it makes sense because it is a protein source and you're trying to prevent from allergies. So I can see what the thought behind it was. It's not like it's, it's not like it's feeding something crazy, but it also doesn't really sit with me very well. I'd rather feed something more natural and more healthy. I agree. Couldn't like, you know, this were my child. I wouldn't be feeding it like chicken, chicken hair, basically. Well, and and, and, and you, you hit the nail absolutely on the head that, that I believe you know, my, my, my thesis on this is that people these days are pet parents. They're not pet owners. They're not got a pet in a cage. Absolutely. Their child. That's their child. And, 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 you know, 
you know, you wouldn't eat pet feathers or chicken feathers. So you wouldn't feed your dog chicken feathers. And, and, you know, you want your food to be healthy sourced from a place where there's, there's no artificial ingredients, there's no additives, no hormones. You want it made well and you want a complete and balanced diet. And so basically we decided we wanted to do this for pets and give that same nutrition that I would accept for myself. I want to give to my dog. And that's animal kind. That is animal kind. So, so animal kind, we, we, Again, that same idea of, of um, well, firstly, I didn't realize quite what I was getting into because it's been it's been a year of work. I thought it was going to be a couple of weeks behind a spreadsheet and formula diet that's been, it's been really, really um, rewarding, but really challenging. But the same idea that I tried to find the best people to help me with this mission. Um, <clears throat> one of my colleagues had a friend who was a, a very well thought of pet nutritionist in Seattle. We got him on board. Uh, we have a factory in New Zealand. Well, we have a factory partner in New Zealand who's just a wonderful guy who can make food using a different process of freeze drying that sort of locks in the nutrition. So we found all these people from around the world to what I think has made a, a diet, which is the best that you can give for your pet, in my opinion, but it also has an ingredient list that my grandma can read and she knows exactly what each ingredient is. And it's not kind of weird stuff. It's stuff that you'd be prepared to eat. So healthy nutrition that's good for you. And our, our catchphrase on this is every bag has a purpose. You know, every bag is healthy of everybody's nutritious but also has a purpose for the planet it's, it's well made it doesn't it uses sustainable agriculture it, it, it's, it's it's done right and that's what we're kind of trying, trying to do um so that's that's animal kind which is sort of what really really excites me at the moment the other brand that really excites me is, is natural animal solutions which is not our own brand um but we are sort of working very closely with them i was speaking to their australian company i was speaking to them this morning um where they make 100 natural health supplements and remedies for pets and i mean this is this is non-prescription medicine this is sort of this is things that you and i can buy over the counter but my idea behind this is you know there are times when you need to see the vet and there are times when your dog needs antibiotics there are times when your dog needs strong treatment but there are a lot of times when they don't and reaching for that antibiotic as the first thing is possibly not the right choice in this day and age um we need to have a line of treatments which fills that niche between you know between healthy dog to very ill dog or healthy cat to very ill cat, there's a range of, you know, well-being kind of products that can really change the market. And that's where our natural animal solutions fits in. Everything's sustainable. That's a big passion of mine these days, especially because I have young children, right? Like you talked about sustainable agriculture. You talked about, you know, delivering food to pets that our grandmas or great grandmas would recognize as real food. Um, you can read every word on the label. Like, and, and a purpose in the bag, right? Every, every piece of fuel that, that we're consuming these days should be purposeful. Um, and, you know, to me, this is not just a sustainable business. This is sustainable work, right? What you're creating here, your customers can vote for by buying it to support your business. And they're, and they're, and they're in a way, also voting for sustainable work. And that drives a sustainable world. I mean, a lot of people are, are thinking about sustainability from a climate change and a consumption perspective. Um, you know, at work, what we're always thinking about is sustainable work. Work needs to be something that is virtuous. It not only creates value for the consumer, it creates value for the company and for the team on board. So I'm so happy to hear about what you're doing at, at um, Animal Kind. And, and if you have these values that you make the product with, I mean, we had a product meeting yesterday and we actually rejected one of the product ideas because it didn't fit with those values. And if you, if you have this very, very clearly set in your head of what you do and what you don't do, it makes a decision about how to proceed. To be honest with you, very easy sometimes because some things yes. just, even, even if it seems like it may be, there's a market for it, if it doesn't fit what you do, you're going to be not living up to your promise to, your, your, to yourself and to your customers. And then you and, and end up damaging your brand and end up damaging what you do. Um, you know, being once you make these values, you've got to stick to it. And I gotta say, it's actually not easy. I mean, one of the, so some of the ingredients we may we 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 have, um, we could have gone for something cheaper, we could have gone for something easier, but we had to reject that. And we hope that that again becomes our legal unfair competitive advantage. This is what we do, and we are priced within the, the sort of within the zone, but if someone can buy a cheaper dog food than me, absolutely. You can go down to, you can go down to the supermarket and you can buy something cheaper than me. Like you said, I mean, sustainability is just so important. 
And I don't think there's going to be one switch we flick where suddenly we can take all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and the world is back on track. I think change comes in multiple small additives. You add, you know, if, if every decision you make is framed around what is the better way forward and you add all those decisions together, a lot of small changes become big change. And, and you might say, <clears throat> how is buying a dog food sustainable? Why does that really matter compared to, uh, you know, say the EV car revolution? Little bits add together. And so that, that's- Absolutely. And you know, to reduce carbon emissions, we have to start making the right decisions and the right choices from a consumer perspective, from a business perspective. And all these choices at first will be more expensive. You, you, you're you gonna have to pay for those choices in the beginning, but in order, but once the, the adoption begins, then, you know, the price will drop and, and the scale, the scale will, will help move the needle. And again, <laughs> these have to be value-based. Absolutely, I agree. And I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's a really interesting thing. I'm sure there's economists who have studied this. I think there is, some degree of price increase that you can get away with in a sustainable product. But I think you've got to be pretty careful. We are, we are really, really careful to make sure that we are on par with our what we see as our sort of competitors. We certainly, we certainly don't think price is not important, but we think it's not the major thing we compete on. Let me say that much. And I'm curious, what's it like building a animal kind? Like, do you go to a food lab? Do you come up with recipes? Like, what are some of your products, you know, that are, that are on, on, on the shelves today? So the one that's been really, really popular uh, is uh, is is a, a treat that's made of lamb and manuka honey, and it sounds quite. Uh, that's all it is, just lamb and manuka honey. And we made this originally for dogs, um, but as is always way with everything we do, the guys in the office and I tested it first on our own pets. We were just tested is the wrong word. We knew it was safe. We knew it was good. We wanted to see how much they loved it. And the guy in the office. How bad cat- could it be? It's lamb and manuka honey. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but the guy in the office with a cat said, oh, my cat just loves this stuff. And he's buying he's buying more bags than all of us are. So we realized that this is going to work well for cats and dogs. We had a line at Hong Kong Pet Expo that was so long, the organizers had to close the doors and stop people coming into the expo because basically it was it was over it was staking around the whole place. And this was people lining up to get the to get the lamb manuka food. Um, we had one partner who bought three bags a week ago, um, who ordered yesterday 300 bags. And wow. now we're, we're and so we, we've got um, four, four sort of pet foods, two dog and two cat, and two ranges of treats and some canned food. As of yesterday, we're essentially completely sold out in a week, which is which is great but terrible because we don't want to make sure anyone gets left out. We got more, we are, we got more on the way, so it's okay. But it's it's um, it's been a really really interesting experience. And what I'd say about it is, I have a friend who's an artist, uh, you know, uh, um, painting and, and and so forth. And I was round at his studio the other day. And he said, it's absolutely terrifying being an artist because I paint from the heart and then I put it out there and I expect people to pay money for it and to love it. And it's something so personal. And if someone turns around and says, oh, that's not very good or blah, 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 it, it really hurts. And, and, and it's this really weird way. I, I don't think my food is art. I'm not saying that. But it was something that the team and I created from our hearts. And when it met the market and people actually said they liked it, I didn't realize how important that was to me personally until it actually happened. From your heart. And I feel like that's how you do everything you do, right? And that's something that I think is a core differentiator. Um, and and food is art. I, I happen to be a home cook as well. You know, when I cook something, I'm always thinking about the people who might eat it. Like, you know, is it is it too hard for, for my granny to chew on? Is it too spicy for my children? But is it tasty enough for my husband? And so all of, of you know, all of the, 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 the thought, the care you have, the love you put into what you do, like you said, is the core value because you absolutely can make something cheaper, something that's more scalable, something that nobody has to line up for because you could just pre-order that early on. But I think what you're on the cusp of is, you know, this product market fit for animal kind. And if you... It's, it's a really bad problem to not have any product on the <laughs> shelves that your customers can buy, but it's also a really good problem to know that, wow, people are, are really enjoying this product. I mean, you're right that, that, that because we have a production process that is 
Uh, it, we have a unique production process. It's different to what anyone else is doing. And because it is made in New Zealand, because it is sort of sourced for ingredients that are not just sort of factory, it's not factory agriculture, it's not feedlots, it's not mass production, it's not, it's not sort of the, the nasty side of the agriculture business. It, it is harder to, to rapidly scale that side of the business. However, we are, luckily, luckily our factory partner in New Zealand is a wonderful guy. Um, and he's got more food on the way and as well, we've solved the problem this morning. And as I say, it's a good problem to have, but it's, um, the other thing that I found really interesting, I was talking to, to Trilby, my wife, about this. Um, it, it's been a fascinating journey to go from being a vet where you kind of, you wake up in the morning and your job is to fix some dogs and cats, and then you go home in the evening. And, and this is really a very, very different business, uh, you know, where you're managing supply chains and you're, you're producing something and you're really got sort of, you're trying to grow this business quite quickly and you're trying to get in front of other people and there's marketing involved and there's warehousing and logistics and all this stuff. It, it, it's been a, and I guess that's the other thing I'd say to people is, is um, don't pigeonhole yourself and don't get trapped doing one thing for too long. I think that was kind of the other reason we moved on from Creature Comforts a little bit is I felt it, I had done everything I could for that business and it's time to try something else. And, and, and I'd, I'd, <clears throat> I'd say that to anybody, I say that to my own children, you know, don't, don't limit yourself. Move, when, when you feel you've done as much as you can in one thing, try a new challenge, use what you consider your unfair competitive advantage, uh, what you're good at, but then package that into something else, something quite different, see how you do it that too. And this circles back with the reckless and adventurous kind of analogy, right? It's the adventure, but the limitless part of the adventure has to be, you have to put the hard work in. Like nothing, nothing just happens by itself. Like you said, you need to find the best people, the best coach, the best team, and put your heart into like creating the best products. And I want to dive a bit more into natural animal solutions as well. Mm. Like I, I love supplements and I'm a huge fan of preventative care. Um, and, and like you said, to me, this sounds like another adventure as well, right? Getting into the supplements business for pets. Like what, what are some of, what are some of the supplements that, that you guys are coming up with and, and how's yeah, that so coming along? So, I mean, say, for example, some of the really common problems we have with dogs and cats are <clears throat> the skin problems, anxiety issues, travel issues, and digestive issues. Uh, and I guess those are probably the four most common things I see as a vet. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 you know, with, well, look, I'll be honest with you. I mean, in, in Hong Kong, um, we have, well, to my knowledge, we have the highest rate of prescribing Prozac for dogs and cats of anywhere in the world. Um, and Prozac being a behavioral drug that is a fairly strong sort of mood altering drug. And I, I just don't really think we should be prescribing dogs Prozac, at least, at least not the vast majority. Um, and of course, there'll be one or two out there who like there's, you know, there is real need for that, but it's not something generally we should be using day to day. So my idea was to find ways to avoid using a drug like that or, or for skin problems to avoid using steroids or for digestive problems to avoid using antibiotics. So, and, and so the idea was to find a supplement range that could do that. And, and you know, it, it, life is a set of kind of opportunities that come up. Um, and I heard someone say, you know, once that, that being in business is kind of like going surfing, that a whole lot of waves will come by. And, you know, if you want to succeed in business, you've got to be ready to catch that wave when it comes by. And you've got to know which wave is for you, but you've got to be ready to go. And, and funny enough, this opportunity with Natural Animal Solutions came up uh a friend said oh i know a guy in australia he's got this company i think it'd fit really well for you you should talk um and as a vet i'll be honest as a vet you're a little bit suspicious of kind of natural stuff that you don't want it to be crystals and and, and burning incense you want to actually have medical backing behind it so i was a little right. bit suspicious but i talked to this guy um in australia and uh and really liked what he did there was a scientific basis behind it from his side, he was really interested in working with someone with veterinary knowledge because it could sort of help formulate the products better, help give better understanding of what the needs were. And it was just a really good fit. So, so I caught the wave and we we decided to sort of work together on it. Um, and, and it's actually been really beneficial that I had a call with him this morning and he said, look, you know, I love what you guys do with Animal Kind. I want to bring that to Australia. You know, let's work together and bring that to Australia. And so there's been this amazing synergy. And again, it's just finding when I say a member of my team, he doesn't work for me, but we work very closely together. And so he's part of my team um, and, and, and I'm part of his team and finding these teammates where there's this, this where you are stronger together than you would be as, as separate parts is, is, is what makes it great. 
And on Catching the Wave, I know that you're also expanding into the Greater Bay Area. Um, you have presence now in Hong Kong and Macau. How's that coming along? What's that like? What's that wave like? It's, it's, so this is, so, okay, the, the first thing I'll tell you is that um, I thought I could do this by myself. And I realize now how crazy that was. I've got some amazing people who work for me here who really understand the China market because, and this was a learning curve for me that, that you know, Hong Kong is not a little China and, and, and every market has its own nuances, what people want, the only, and what your competitive advantage in Hong Kong is. There's probably that in China as well, but there's a slightly different lens on it. And you've got to learn the intricacies of each market by having people in that market who understand what matters. Um, and that would apply for, you know, my, my, my friend James at National Animal Solutions in Australia, my team in Shenzhen in China. These people understand those markets and that's why we work together. It has been um, absolutely fantastic. I'm really excited for how fast it's growing. It's, it's been a real learning curve for me. But like I said before, you know, if you get a bit too comfortable where you are, do something new, which is not reckless, but is adventurous. And this for me is just another adventurous challenge. I really hope it's going to work because I think, well, I really believe it's going to work because I believe what we are doing, promoting the, the pet parent concept and the human animal bond is just as important in the Great Bay Area as it is in Hong Kong or anywhere else in the world. Now, final question for you, Dr. David. Um, your book, Relentless, talks about the World Marathon Challenge. Now, how do you apply sort of your marathon mentality or relentlessness in your entrepreneurial ventures? I started off that journey with sort of marathons, whatever, to get fit and, and let's face it, to win an argument with my wife. Um, <clears throat> but after a while, I actually realized that there was a super, really valuable lesson in it. Anytime you do a marathon or any kind of big sporting event, you're going to have bad times and things are going to go wrong. Um, and, you know, and it's how you pick yourself up and keep going that separates someone who does well in that from someone who never finishes the race. Um, and, and say in the World Marathon Challenge and the seven marathon things, uh, I, I got frostbite in two toes. I actually broke an ankle in Morocco and, 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 and still I managed to pick myself up and finish. Um, it, I mean, these things were not terrible. I was able to run, but it wasn't much fun. But I guess doing that and you think the same happens in business. And really, I can tell you that with Creature Compass, with Vetopia, it's not like every day I wake up and just think, oh, wow, today is even better than yesterday. There are, like everybody, there are challenges and things don't always go your way. Um, but you've got to learn how to reframe that and get over that and keep going. Um, and, 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 and that's what I learned from the World Marathon Challenge was things are not always going to go your way. But if you have a good fundamental plan and you really have a belief in yourself and you have good people around you, you'll be okay. Dr. David, we can't wait to see what happens at Vetopia, this next you know, seven continent marathon that you're running and can't wait for more people to try Animal Kind and Natural Animal Solutions. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Erica, I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for listening today. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe. To hear more from entrepreneurs and investors on why they got started, how they got through the hard parts, and what they'll be doing next. If you're inspired by these stories and want to work or collaborate with any of our founders or investors, reach out by searching for Cocoon Born to Fly on LinkedIn. We'd love to connect there. Download more episodes or subscribe via Spotify or YouTube.